With a couple inspired keyboard strokes, a brilliant idea can come to life as a genius invention. Whether it's a successful game or a polarizing font, these four computer pioneers changed our office life forever. Solitaire is one of the most popular computer games of all time, and we went to find the guy who created it. Yes, may I help you? Are you the person that wrote Solitaire for Microsoft? Yes, but that was a long time ago. We gotta talk. Can we come in? Great. Thank you. All right. This is Wes. I'm Wes Cherry, and I wrote Windows Solitaire. I wrote the game in 1988 as an intern. Uh, internships at Microsoft were really an uh, all-encompassing thing, but I squoze it in there in the few little hours of my free time. For those who need a refresher, Solitaire was played on the computer using a mouse. Cards are pulled from the deck in an effort to stack cards in order by suit. And if you won, you got an awesome display of cards cascading towards you. I came up with the idea to write Solitaire for Windows out of boredom, really. There wasn't many games right at the time, so we had to make them. In the mid to late 90s was just when people started really getting computers in their home. Microsoft officially said that Solitaire was there to teach people how to use the mouse. But in reality, it was just really just something to have fun with. Before they were released Windows, of course, Bill Gates uh, got a shot at it. His biggest complaint was that Solitaire was too hard to win. And once people figured out the mouse, it became a favorite pastime. The number of hours wasted on Solitaire is really countless. I can say that right after Solitaire was released in 1990, there was a world recession. So many people were playing it in the workplace that Wes came up with what he called the boss Key. Press a special key and a spreadsheet was come up that made it look like you were doing real work. But uh, Microsoft made me take it out. Considering this game has been around for decades, you must have made a ton of money. I was not paid, not a single cent. At one time I said if I only got a penny per copy, I would be very rich. So far, only 14 people have made good on that. I'm still waiting for the rest of you. Well, you heard the man. Do you still work with computers? I work with uh, Apple now. Apples, actually, and I own a cidery. Uh, Wes? There's something behind you. Wes, run! It's a time-honored thing to put your name on your artistic productions. Writers have their name on the book. Painters write their name in the corner. Why couldn't video game designers have their name in their games? This is a story about one man who took on a giant tech company and changed the gaming world in the process. My name is Warren Robinette. I'm the creator of Adventure, the first action adventure game. This was a video game that I wrote working for Atari in uh, the late 70s. They treated us badly in several different ways. No royalties, no name on the box, no external recognition being told that we were easily replaceable. They disrespected us. So Warren hatched the perfect plan. What I did was I hid my name in the game, in a secret room that was really hard to get to. When you got in there, the screen filled up with a flashing movie marquee that said, created by Warren Robinette. Atari shipped out 200,000 copies of Adventure before anyone discovered Warren's secret room. How did they find out about that? A 15-year-old boy in Salt Lake City wrote a letter to Atari and he very clearly explained how to get into the secret room. And Warren wasn't worried at all about repercussions. What are they going to do? Take away my royalty? Well, they weren't giving us any royalties. Fire me? It so happened that I'd already quit. But to Warren's surprise, his act of rebellion was well received by Atari's new lead game designer, Steve Wright. He's musing to himself about this situation and he said, it was kind of cool to have hidden surprises in video games. It's like waking up on Easter morning and going out and finding colored Easter eggs under the bushes and flowers. Everything ended all right for Warren Robinette. You can't say the same for Atari. Atari actually collapsed in one year. It imploded. Personally, I think there's some poetic justice there that the big, powerful, rich, New York, pushy guys could not defeat the one little 26-year-old programmer who just had a sneaky idea and pulled it off without telling anybody. It's 1995. Your word processor is open, 
And before you press a single key, you make the most important decision of your life. What font do I use? All the usual fonts are too conventional. There were very few, very casual typefaces that you could use. You keep scrolling. Too stately, too boring. But then... It pops out of the menu. What is this font? It was so different than everything else. The way it flows is strange. It had irregularity about it. And uniquely flawed. The stems aren't perfectly straight. They are quite wobbly. This is the font you want. And in that moment, you and millions of other people click on the button that says... Comic Sans. How did a font both loathed and cherished come to dominate the world? My name is Vincent Conair. I was a typographic engineer at Microsoft. I contributed to lots of fonts like Webdings, Trebuchet, and most notably Comic Sans. So it's all my fault. To understand Comic Sans, you have to understand its creator. Years before his work at Microsoft, Vincent was working on his undergrad in New York City. We went to university in the 1980s. I was a quite young, rebellious, fine art student. He'd spend a lot of time in art spaces. And I'd walk through the galleries of the old Soho and look at paintings and, and artwork. To him, what separated good art from bad art was this simple benchmark. If you didn't notice them, I considered that was bad. And if you did notice, it was good, because at least they made you stop and look. It either shocked you or you really liked it. But if you didn't even notice and you just walked through, it was a disaster. Vincent would take that philosophy to Microsoft, where he was challenged to make a playful font for a program called Microsoft Bob. And so I looked at Batman and the Watchmen and pretty much tried to draw on the computer something that looked similar to that, but not copying it. So that's how Comic Sans was made, by just looking at comic books and comic characters. Not everyone was a fan of the font's quirks. My boss, Robert Norton, he didn't really like the font and he thought it should be a bit more typographic. And I argued and said, no, it should be weird. And, and I thought it stood out and it wasn't boring typography that's in, in a school book. Though the font didn't make it to the release of Microsoft Bob, it was eventually pre-installed on every Macintosh by 1996. I started to see it when it was in, in the wild, so to speak. The first one I remember was a neon sign over a store called Fun Stamps. That's when I realized it's going to get used any way anybody wants to use it. And that just snowballed from there. The font spread like wildfire in ways Vincent didn't even imagine. When I travel the world and see it in, on beach towels. War memorials. On bread. Street signs. On everything. Its overexposure even spurred a group of designers to start an anti-comic sans movement. I thought it was funny. I didn't really find it offensive. After all these years, Vincent finds himself content with how history will remember him. And Comic Sans is not one of the better pieces of art, but conceptually it's one of the best things I've ever done. It probably is the best thing I, I have ever done. This is the IBM Personal Computer. It was the most advanced computing machine ever created. However, this isn't a story about a computer, but a story about when a computer stops working, and the man who created a way to start it all over. The man who invented Control-Alt-Delete. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Bradley, but you can call me Dr. Dave. Back in 1980, I worked on the IBM personal computer. My particular job on the IBM PC was writing the basic input-output system. Even with an elite team of engineers and designers, not everything goes smoothly when you're building a computer. We had programs that ran most of the time, but when they failed, the only way to reset the system was turn the power off, wait a while, turn the power back on, and it would go through a very long self-test. But the system might die every five to 10 minutes. What he needed was a way to shortcut the restart process. One of the things we discussed was putting a reset button on it. But if you put it on the system board, there's a chance that you could hit it by mistake and all your data gets lost. So what we did was came up with a three-key sequence 
it would reset the computer and you couldn't hit by mistake. A single control key, a single alt key, and then all the way over at the right hand side, a single delete key. When you hit that control alt delete, you're deleting everything that you're working on right now and starting new. I was also able to skip over many of the tests. So instead of taking a minute or two, it was 10 or 15 seconds. But it wasn't a big deal at the time. It was like number 17 on the list of 100 different things I had to fix. Even though it was built only as a development tool, programmers began incorporating the feature into their applications. From there, it was released into the wild, but didn't immediately reach pop culture status. For years, it was no big deal. And then at the 20th anniversary of the IBM PC, that's when Control-Alt-Delete became sort of a cultural icon. It was the simplest and easiest way to fix your problem. Hit Control-Alt-Delete, start all over. Despite all this, Dr. Dave doesn't think much of this contribution to computing history. I did lots of things with IBM, but all everybody remembers is Control-Alt-Delete. But I'll take that. The fame of Control-Alt-Delete means that I worked on a very successful product, and I'm very proud of having been able to do that. Hey everybody, my name is Drew Beebe, and I'm here in my terrible home studio that I've made during quarantine, and I wanted to tell you about our new podcast called Great Big Story. It's got more surprising and delightful stories just like this one. So head over to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcasts, and download Great Big Story.